We are really honored to have you here. Yeah, and he is known for a lot of things. I think everyone out here knows about you better than you know yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the Dragon's Den of Turkey is won business awards and he heads the, you know, the Business Angels Network in Turkey. So, a lot of awesome stuff. So, sir, we are going to just open up things for you to talk. Okay. okay? And we also want you to interact with the audience and, you know, after the session, stay back for some time. We would love that. Okay. All right. And the kind of questions and what we want to hear from you. You are from Turkey. You have had a fantastic entrepreneurial journey. Learnings, what went right, what went wrong, what could you do better. And tell us about Turkey, India, what can we do together. I think that's what everyone is interested about. So without much further ado, let me give you your mic. And let's uh, rock and roll, sir. Thanks Thank so you. much, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, since you know more about me than me, it's time you to speak and I listen and take note down. Um, now, I think uh, we have to start from this startup complex theory. Uh, today's you are all entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs. How many entrepreneurs there are here? Okay, and potential ones? Good. Uh, I love the potential ones more. Oh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm joking. Uh, I want to ask a question to you, an important question, I think. What is the difference between entrepreneur and startup? Because you are an incubator, here is an incubation center. Yes, it is. Kind of. So, so, okay, so I'm going to say whoever raises your hand who wants to talk. Yes. Immediately. We don't have time. Guys, come on. Let's be yes. active. The difference between startup and entrepreneur. Yes. Uh, at certain point of... Yeah. Uh, for a startup, at certain point of time in its journey, it has to scale up. Okay. Okay. It has to turn into something which is uh, bigger in, than what it did. But an entrepreneur can be someone who 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 owns on his own. The, maybe a what say the vegetable seller, auto rickshaw. Entrepreneur doesn't want to scale up. He, he may, wants to scale may down. He may may not. <laughs> <laughs> but you are very close to the answer. Startup as a goal is not to make this business until he dies. This is startup. Entrepreneur doesn't have a concrete strategy to make an exit. He may do it by himself as long as he can, or his children, or his grandsons. His purpose is to make a business that will always save him in the world. This is the main difference. Entrepreneur doesn't have an exit strategy. Startup is creating the business to sell. Entrepreneur is creating the business to make it bigger and make more money. So entrepreneur is focusing on selling more to customers on the street Startup is focusing on selling the business to another potential entrepreneur or business owner, to VC, to bank, to IPO. This is the difference. Why we have to clarify this issue? Because we have to know what we are talking about, isn't it? And what I know from all these uh, conferences that entrepreneurs, startups, scale-ups, SMEs, <coughs> don't know that they are positioning themselves. What is SME? Small, medium-sized enterprise. Which is, again, uh, which was founded by an entrepreneur, but now it is a little bit in another way, not a startup. But interestingly, 95% of the world economy is driven by SMEs, not startups. We have to understand this very clearly, this is very important. And 60% of these 95% is recruiting up to three people, very small businesses. So small businesses are very important because they are the main engine of the world economy. Who understood this very well? 
one of the guys who understood the importance of entrepreneurs, SMEs, and startups is Obama. He declared the 21st century as a century of entrepreneurs, SMEs, and startups. Why? The reason is very simple. In 19, by the way, for the ones who didn't check my profile, I was the only angel investor US president gave a personal audience. And we met at the White House and made a uh, debate on entrepreneurship. We used that order to get them here. The, you used it in your promotions, good. So now I will talk about more about this uh, uh, debate. In 1950s or 60s, if the President of the United States, Obama, would be the US President in 1950, he would again recall the uh, Global Entrepreneur Summit as the Global Entrepreneur Summit or not. I think he would call this summit as maybe Global Inventor Summit but not the Global Entrepreneur Summit. Because in 1950s, 60s, invention was very important. Inventors were very important for the economy. And they didn't need a set of skills to convert, to turn their inventions to innovation. Because buyer, customer was ready. Customer was ready to buy anything invented 50 years ago. But today this is not the case. Today innovation is important. If you cannot bring your invention to the market, it means nothing for the governments. It means nothing for the society. Because governments today need more finance like us. They also need money. And they, their main source of finance is tax. If the invention is not an innovation, they cannot raise more tax from this business, isn't it? If you cannot sell anything, then this just shows that you are an intelligent person, but that's all. But the governments today are very intelligent. They are looking more than invention. So if you can convert your invention to innovation, this means the governments will be able to raise more tax and for more uh, jobs for the society, more wealth and more social justice. So innovation is very important today. Who, the, who is the main catalyzer between the inventor and innovator? It is entrepreneur. Startup, SAP or whatever, however you call it. But it is an entrepreneur. We need an entrepreneur to convert this invention to innovation. So 21st century is the age of entrepreneurs. And Obama is calling his summits as the Global Entrepreneurship Summit. 50 years ago, entrepreneur word was not in our literature, by the way. It's a very innovation. If you would say innovation to someone on the street, you would get you wouldn't understand anything. Entrepreneur, scale up, start up, these are the buzzwords of today and we don't know what will be the buzzwords of tomorrow as we didn't know what they were yesterday, isn't it? So, uh, entrepreneurs are very important catalyzers of the world economy because everything is uh, standing over their skills. If they can convert the invention to innovation, then that's fine. If they cannot, then this economy is not going to benefit from the world economy as much as it can. So, entrepreneurship is the first stage. Entrepreneurship is a word that I produced. The one who wants to be an entrepreneur would be an entrepreneur. We shouldn't mix the entrepreneurship stage with the entrepreneurship stage. Because anyone who uh, gets an idea thinks that he's an entrepreneur. No, this is not the case. 
we have to clarify this stage. You, he is a potential entrepreneur, but he is not at the entrepreneurship stage. If this business idea, idea comes into practice, comes into implementation, if he decides to set up his own business, goes to the tax office, gets the documentation, hires the premise, then he is at the entrepreneurship stage. But I think we have to also differentiate the smart entrepreneur and entrepreneur. Because today the world is 7 billion. 20% of this world is living in your country. <laughs> Another 20% is in China. So half of the world population in these two countries. So I think it, uh, you are the people who can understand the importance of smart entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship better than anybody else in the world. If there are so many players in the market, then we have to focus on the smart ones. Smart ones will be it will have the competitive advantage. Because if everybody wants to become an entrepreneur, then the ones who are the smart ones will be the winners, isn't it? So in order to be a smart entrepreneur, then before coming to entrepreneurship stage, you should focus on innovation. If someone is selling this water to one dollar at the corner of the street, entrepreneur, may decide to set up another shop at the other corner of the street and sell it to one dollar. This is the entrepreneur. But if you are a smart entrepreneur, you make another decision. You also set up another shop at the corner of the street with a different slogan. My water is the first water who will make your dream better tonight. Or who will uh, make you smell money on Saturday. <laughs> you should create an innovation. If you don't make an innovation here, what happens? The guy at the corner of the street is selling this water for the last 20 years and making money. You will come to the street and start selling the same water. We'll spend so much money for marketing purposes. We'll use the billboards, newspapers, radio stations for your commercials. We'll spend money from your pocket. So, and most that you are only also selling the same water. But you will understand that the most intelligent player of this entrepreneurship game is not you. Is not the other guy on the other street. Customer. Customer will see your advertisement, your commercials, will like to drink this water, and will not come to your shop. He will go to other shop. Why? Because he knows that the other shop is selling this water and he doesn't want to take risk by expressing any water. Because both are one dollars. However, the other guy proved for the last 20 years that he is selling a good water. So, customer is very intelligent. Customer doesn't enjoy risk. If there are two products with the same price, he will always prefer the one he experienced. But if you are a smart entrepreneur, and if you are a uh, claiming that your water is going to add an extra value to you, then this customer will say, let me try it. When he said, let me try it, this is a good passport for you to come into the pocket of the customer. When you use this passport visa to the pocket of the customer and take the money and put this water into this bucket. And if this customer finds this extra value, then you are a smart entrepreneur. If he doesn't find the value you are claiming, you are also one of the other entrepreneurs. 
your entrepreneurial journey will not go on so much. So the first critical moment is to create the innovation as a smart entrepreneur. And the second critical moment of this journey is the marketing and sales stage. If you go on selling your products, then you, your entrepreneurial journey will go. If you cannot, it will stop them. It will stop and unfortunately will take you to back with some loose. This is the difference. In the beginning, you didn't have any loom. But here, if you cannot go selling, then another life is waiting for you. So the risk of the entrepreneurial journey is starting at the unselling stage. If you achieve selling to the customer, to more customers, then your journey is very easy. Then branding will come by itself, then franchising will come, then institutionalization will come, because while you are selling this product, you are also selling your brand. A few years later, independent entrepreneurs will start calling you and will say, let me get your franchise and sell it in my region. When you received calls, telephone calls, Facebook messages, emails from independent entrepreneurs, this means you are on the right way. This means you are also owning your own brand. Which means you have now two products to sell. Water and bread. That's good. If franchisees, potential franchises are calling you, then they are assuming that you also created your institutionalization, you've completed your institutionalization. This is an assumption. It's an assumption. In reality, institutionalization comes after making the franchise agreements. This is the reality. Yes, it should come before, we know, but generally, uh, the entrepreneurial mindset works in a different way. Entrepreneurial mindset uh, works better after they make the agreements, not before making the agreements. So let me take this out because I am in a hot country, I know. <laughs> so you are not hot, but I am hot. <laughs> uh, so, uh, of course, you complete institutionalization structure. It is not a problem. Institutionalization uh, is something very easy. You will understand the importance of management uh, lessons. Uh, while I was studying at the university, uh, I couldn't understand why uh, people are studying business administration. I couldn't understand it. Uh, but after coming to the entrepreneurial uh, journey, I understood very well. Uh, marketing, management, product management, financial management, and the management and organization of the country, four departments. This is, uh, this is, uh, these are the departments you have to complete very well at this stage. And the third important uh, milestone of your life is coming, leadership. You have to decide, now you have your own customers, you have your own franchisees, you have your uh, own uh, staff, but also the staff of you. You are becoming a big family. At this stage, you have to decide if you are going to become an employee of your own company, or if you are going to be the leader of your own company, invite and professional guy to manage the company. This is something you have to decide. Startups generally become very professional and they hire professional CEOs. SMEs prefer running their own businesses. So in the beginning I wanted to make a difference between entrepreneur and startup. If you have a startup mindset then you can become a good leader of your own business. If you have an SME mindset, 
you can be a good employee of your own company. If you have the startup mindset and if you complete it, if you decided to lead your own company, this means you will have time. That's very important. Time to spend for more innovative business ideas. Because after you spend your e uh, years to create new innovations, then you cannot live without creating innovation. It is becoming a little bit a uh, lifestyle to make uh, something new, bring it to market, and see the implications of your products and services. But at this stage, you have to understand the difference between the beginning of the stage and at this stage. The difference is, in the beginning stage, you didn't have money, you didn't have network, you didn't have know-how, and you didn't have the skill, the skill to make mentorship. But now, you have finance, know-how, network, and the skill to make mentorship. In the beginning of the story, the only criteria for your success was the amount of money you download from the world to your bank account. The only criteria. As much as you can download from the world to your bank account. But now, to upload the world to give something back to the world, isn't it? So, the mindset is a little bit changing. If you are at this level, if you have a CEO running your company, if you are granting your life with incomes, franchise fees, etc. from your core business, I think it is now a good idea to give back to the world by investing in new startups not entrepreneurs, startups with the same mindset who are going to create new jobs and will lead their businesses in the future like you. Some people may donate to schools, may hospitals donate it to the government to give back to the world. I think giving to the back to the world uh, for, a, for entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, is very practical if you can convert yourself to angel investor. You were a startup and you become angel investor, which means you will invest in startups like you and put your know-how, mentorship, and network to the businesses of these new young entrepreneurs. Young doesn't mean the age. Young means the one who starts up. Anyone. My question is, let's say I have a grandmother and my grandmother is 95 years old. My grandfather died, who was a successful entrepreneur, SME, and my grandmother has a huge heritage from my grandfather. Hundred million dollars. She is 95 years old. And the next year, she is the most tax payer of the city. Is my grandmother a successful entrepreneur? This is my first question. And the second question, she has hundred million dollars and she wants to invest in startups. Can she be a good angel investor? Two questions. Is she a good entrepreneur? No. Can she become an <clears throat> angel investor? Yes. Yes. No. 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 Because she will just put money. Angel invest. If she just puts money, she is an investor. If she puts more than money, know-how, which she doesn't have, network, which she doesn't have, Mentorship, but like a mentorship she's going to put on the table, she cannot become an angel investor. Angelship of the game is coming from the uh, from your network, from your know-how and mentorship. So that's enough now 
and now I'll sit down and please ask me your questions and clap your hands. Awesome Simple questions. Simple questions. Simple questions. Who mentored you? How did you? I mean, you said that you know you are you are a you are a mentor now. You are president of the Turkey Business Angel Association. Who mentored you? Who guided you? Who inspired you? Good question. I didn't have a mentor. Uh, I didn't have an angel investor. I didn't have a VC. I didn't have a bank supporter. Uh, but. I had a different mindset to find which made me find the most valuable source of finance. Before telling this valuable source of finance, let's check what life source of finances are available for entrepreneurs, for startups, for scale-ups, crowdfunding platforms, families and friends, isn't it? Uh, banks. VCs, mini VCs, syndications, co-investment funds, government support, uh, business plan competitions, angel investors, IPOs, stock exchange, chambers. These are all the sorts of finance for entrepreneurs available in the markets today. I didn't use any of them. I found another source of finance. Yes, customer. customer. Customer is the most valuable source of finance. So my mentor was customer. Awesome. Awesome. Because customer didn't want equity from me, didn't ask for the accounts at the end of the month, didn't uh, customer just wanted what I. Uh, what I promise to give him or her. That's all. As much as long as I gave my promise to him, then it worked. I had just four hundred dollars in the beginning. Uh, you can download the Kindle version of my book. By the way, it is just three three dollars or less than three dollars at Amazon.com. Of the bus in Tjesperka. The original name in Turkey was off the bus into a BMW, but in the States it becomes Sperkar <laughs> because it's a German brand. And uh, this book was translated into many languages. And next week I will sign the Croatian version in Zagreb, uh, the Chinese version uh, uh, three months later. In Albania it became bestseller. It was also published in Macedonia. Uh, in this book, I am telling especially addressed to university students that you don't need uh, finance or network or mentorship or know-how. If you know how to reach the customer with minimum expense. There are two ways to find a solution to this question. How to reach to customer with minimum expense. Either you are going to learn it or you are going to discover it by yourself. Coincidentally, in 1990s, I discovered it by myself. Coincidentally. But today, I know that I cannot discover it by myself because today's competitive environment is tough. 30 years ago, it was easier for me. But today, this is not the case. But, on the other hand, on the other face of the coin, it also seems very simple. Because in 1990s, I didn't have Google. I didn't have Facebook. So I had to, I had to spend a little bit money to reach the customer and to understand if it is going to work. But today, it is very simple to understand if this business idea is going to work or not. Free of charge, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything is available free of charge to understand if the idea is going to work or not. But these 
sources are available for everybody. So the competition is very tough. Everybody can understand immediately and you can, uh, you should uh, find a way to compete uh, at the equal uh, conditions with so many uh, entrepreneurs. This is the difference. You are also the star of Dragon's Den in you know, Turkey. How was, yeah, how was the experience? You meet a lot of entrepreneurs, you meet a lot of startups. And when they talk to you, they pitch to you, how do you treat them? What do you do with them? Do you know what the Dragon's Den is? Everybody knows? Is that Dragon's Den here in India? No. Not exactly, but people watch Shark Tank a lot. Shark Tank? Shark Tank. Uh, I was invited by the Sony Pictures to become one of the Dragons because the criteria uh, to become a Dragon is to come from scratch. Uh, please, as I told you, download the Kindle version and you will see that while I was staying at the dorm of the university in 1992, 22 years old, and just $400 in my pocket, my BMW and driver was waiting in the garden of the university and the secretary general of the university invited me to his office and dismissed me from the dorm because the instructors, professors, complained me if he owns a BMW, why is he staying at the door? <laughs> because it was a government uh, university and everybody was in the queue and he is uh, wasting an opportunity of another uh, guy who needs, uh, who really needs it. So, uh, yes, I owned a BMW to, uh, 12 months later because the general uh, behavioral uh, style of entrepreneurs is if you make a little bit money the first thing is to buy a car <laughs> because it is something uh, that you can show off to the people you stay in the door but car is important <laughs> however I left the door and uh, set up my, uh, the school chain, etc. Et I don't want to go into the details. Uh, but what was the question, by the way? A dragon's dad. So I made everything from scratch and they invited me to become a dragon uh, because uh, thanks to this life story. So what did you, when the entrepreneurs talk to you there, how did you inspire them? How did you, what did you give them as tips? And if you can share some of this with our audience here, it would be awesome. They came to you, they had their ideas, they pitched to you. What advice do you give them? Uh, while uh, setting up my own business in 1992, I visited a guy who was the owner of a real estate chain in Turkey. He was rich. He had some uh, properties in Istanbul. One of them was in downtown of Istanbul, very center. And he didn't use this office. And I tried to convince him to make a school business, a professional tour operating course business, because in 1992 there were 3,500 travel agents in the market and nobody was giving an education to these tra travel agent staff. Because I worked at a travel agent when I was 17 years old at the high school, I knew that there was a great demand uh, for certified travel agent stuff. And I couldn't convince him. I started to visit him regularly. I tried to push him to set up a course center. Because I was a university student, I wanted to transfer myself to this business not as a staff, but as a manager. This was my career plan. And he didn't believe in my business idea. And he said, nobody will come to this course center and will pay to become a staff at a travel agent. Everybody will find a guy who is the friend of the owner of the travel agent and will start working in the travel agent without any certification. So what, So nobody will uh, come and we won't, we won't be able to sell these courses. In my last visit, he said, 
You came again for the same reason. Yes. Come with me, he said. How much money do you have? I said four hundred dollars. From the private lessons uh, fees I collected. Okay, you will give an advertisement on the paper with this four hundred dollars. You will lose this four hundred dollars, and this project. And I will uh, feel all right, and will not see you anymore <laughs> in this office because you will understand that this business will not work with your own $400. Then he invited me to invest my $400 for the business I am claiming as the business of the century. I said, let me think about it. He said, what are you going to think about it? You are ironing my brain for the last two months. You are claiming that uh, it is going to become a very good business. We are going to make millions of dollars from this. Now do it. Put your $400, put an advertisement on the paper and do it. What are you going to think about it? So why I told this story? Uh, I know the psychology of the entrepreneurs coming to stage and pitching the drainers. I passed from the same way. Going to someone and claiming that this business is going to uh, produce millions of dollars and put your uh, money and we will make it together. I know this story. <laughs> If I ask him to put his one dollar, he will say, Let me think about it. So I was the most um, tough uh, one uh, in the dragons, and I became the only dragon who didn't lose even one dollar from the investments. So the Shark Tank uh, Forbes magazine in the United States made an interview with me about my advisors who will come. To Shark Tank in the States. You can Google my name and Forbes and Shark Tank. You can find my advices because I was the only one who didn't lose even one dollar uh, from my investments. I made 11 invest investments in the Dragon Stand. You can find them at the Wikipedia, by the way. Uh, the total investment is not so much around one million dollar, but these uh, investments were uh, sh uh, are showing. Uh, at least an uh, approach of a dragon coming from scratch to what like businesses we enjoy invest. That's very interesting, sir. One last question before I open it up to the audience is that you are now been in India for the last couple of days. This visit, you have been meeting a lot of people. You have met startups, you have met people, entrepreneurs, you have met investors. So to the audience here. What is the advice that you give, and which are the sectors that they should be looking into? What is the technology? What should we be working on? Uh, I'm going to talk about. Uh, this is my first time in India. By the way, do we have coffee? Yeah, we'll get it. Coffee. We'll get it in a minute. Okay. Coffee, but without milk. Okay. <laughs> I ordered the coffee now. Sure. Now, um, I think the image of India. If it is matching with the reality or not, it is something that you know. But the image is the Indian cold rifles are very good. This is what we see from outside of India. Computer engineers. The advantage here is uh, today's global success stories are Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever you check, are coming from IT, mobile, and app industry. 25% of the angel money is also going to these industries, which means code writing and the global success story are very uh, connected with each other. I think this is a good uh, competitive advantage of India, and uh, but I'm a little bit surprised because how India couldn't. Create a global success story. Um, even they have 
such kind of code writings. Maybe, maybe if you check, I, I didn't check, if you check their uh, company profiles of LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, you will see many indie code writers who created innovation there. So maybe uh, creating innovation, code writing, plus marketing, maybe there is something missing in the marketing uh, side that, that can be. So if you develop the marketing side with these code writings, because uh, without code writing, it is really very difficult to catch a success story, not in the globe, also in the country, in your region. So this is a very good uh, competitive advantage. Second, I think advantage of the Indian ecosystem is the diaspora. There, there is a huge Indian diaspora all over the world, which can connect you with the global investors, global markets, and it is easier to sell something uh, to abroad. This is what I added. Maybe you agree with me or not, but this is my uh, perception as a person coming from Istanbul. A lot of people have actually tried to connect with you on LinkedIn, so you'll get a lot of requests from people. Please yeah. do you accept those requests. Yes, I accept them. I, I accept that and I was also a speaker yesterday at the World uh, Startup Expo. Expo. Yeah, Startup Expo. There, there, yeah. You were there? Okay. Uh, did you listen to my... Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, the morning and... You were also awesome. very good. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so you saw how the room was very interested in uh, the entrepreneur, yes, yes, entrepreneurship. Yes, yes. Sure. You spoke about exit strategy, you spoke about marketing, branding. One quick question, sir, before we open up. About a collaboration, when you talked about reach out to the diaspora, talk to people, Indians are there in the rest of the world. Is there something that will excite you to work with, in, with investors here, with the startups, entrepreneurs here? And will you set something up? Are you excited about it? Uh, yes, but... Uh, no. I'm in Istanbul. I'm going to invest in a startup in India. Which means... I will transfer my know-how, mentorship and know-how, isn't it? Good. But how am I going to do it from Istanbul to here? So most probably I would prefer investing in IT, mobile or app industry. I will not enjoy investing in a restaurant chain at the corner of the street because I cannot do it from Istanbul. Even I am investing in an, uh, IT and mobile technologies, I would prefer investing it together in cooperation, in collaboration with another angel investor from India. So I have to have a list of investors and a list of angel networks. That's very important. This is what I also highlighted, you remember, yesterday. If you want to increase the number of global investors for the country, then the number of uh, angel investor network should increase. What is an angel network? And what do they do? Do you know what an angel network is? Angel network is very simple to uh, tell you. Uh, OECD statistics show that 1.2% of entrepreneurs are able to reach angel investor money. 1.2%. One entrepreneur who reached, one in every 10 entrepreneur who reached angel investor money is able to create a success story. This means, as a smart investor, I would prefer putting $10,000 to 10 different entrepreneurs instead of putting $100,000 to one entrepreneur. But the entrepreneur needs $100,000 to run the business. This means I have to complete the rest of the money, $90,000. How am I going to complete it? I will find other 10 investors, smart in investors like me, and we will invest together. In order to invest together, we, will, we should create angel investor groups, networks. So angel investor network means angels who are invested together. 
this is also something very good for the entrepreneur because if I put 100k to one invest to one entrepreneur, this entrepreneur will have one know-how, one network, one mentorship. If he receives 100k from 10 different investors, he will have receive more than one network, more than one mentorship, and more, more than one know-how. So I think, as the incubation center here, uh, you can also uh, start creating your own angel network who will invest in the entrepreneurs of your incubation center members. Is it it? Thank you for sharing your strategy. It's a great point. Yeah. So uh, guys, we're going to open up for questions. So there are some simple rules that we will follow. Please raise your hands. So we can make we take three or four more questions because we should not turn out, sir, and we should leave some time for some people. Uh, and also get you the copy. Yes. Don't have to introduce yourself. Don't have to do anything. Ask the question, and you have 10 seconds to ask the question. So prepare yourself properly. Do not make it too long a question and a long story because we got to listen to sir. That's what really matters. Okay? So, Alison, please help me out with that. Thank you so much. But please speak slowly because I'm not able to understand. So, <laughs> yes. Sure. Hello. Uh, hi. So, uh, I read a book recently. It was called Startup Nation. It's about Israel's uh, success story. So my question is, uh, if you compare the startup culture, the entrepreneurial mindset, and how SMEs work in Turkey, Israel, and India, uh, what would you, uh, what is your opinion on that? Uh, Israel uh, ecosystem is interesting. Uh, the in the global uh, competitiveness index. Israel is number one in innovation and number one country in the world who invest in research and development. That's very important. Uh, in Turkey, that is not the case. I have no idea about India, what about the investment in innovation. But the main idea is, I think we have to ask to the policy makers if their aim, for example, in the universities, is to create the graduate the job seekers of the future or job creators of the future, which one? Because this changed the story, isn't it? And why I am coming to university from your question? Because today's success stories, innovative business ideas are coming from universities. And techno parks, if you go to Israel, for example, you will see that there are many techno parks between the universities. So Turkey also follows the same way. And there are 61 techno parks in Turkey connected with the universities. A few days ago, uh, a team uh, from the London Stock Exchange Group visited the Istanbul Technical University's techno park. And one of the companies, there were 250 companies in the techno park, made a presentation to them. And this company is the innovation center of Beko. Maybe you heard or not, Beko is a TV brand, number one in UK. But it's a Turkish uh, company. But in UK, it's selling the most. And research and development center is within the garden of Istanbul Technical University. They have huge money, they, they can hire any place uh, they like, but they, they want to come to university. Why? Because he said, this, we want to be very close to the uh, young generation. New ideas are coming from them, and we want to see them more in our coffee shop, in our office, and we want the access to skill uh, very much within the university. This is very valuable for us, they said. I think uh, these techno parks within the university's idea is going to spread all over the world. All of them's uh, purpose is to create a Silicon Valley, but it is impossible. We know that 
the setting up a building is not doesn't mean setting up a, a Silicon Valley. But if you set up the mindset, then you can approach to Silicon Valley uh, mindset. And another important thing is, of course, the exit strategy in Israel. This is very important. Uh, Israel is the first country many years ago who discovered the uh, creating exit strategy is something very strategic within the market. And in order to exit rate, in order to uh, leverage the exit efficiency within the market, the government decided to put one to three uh, proportion to the investors, to match the investments. So if I put one dollar, the government is putting three dollars. If this uh, company becomes successful, then all the profit comes to me, not to the government. But if it, so I think it is a good idea to bring this model also in India. In Turkey, it is on the way. The government first released the angel investment law, which brought a 75% tax incentive to angel investors, which means if I put 100K to a startup, I'm able to deduct uh, 75K from my personal income the next year. Now, the government is going to, to match the same amount of money. If I put $1, the government will put $1 with some different conditions than Israel. So, uh, creating good policies is also very important to support the entrepreneurial ecosystems. And who will create these good policies? If you wait from the policy makers to create them, they never do it. You will push them to create it. This is what we did in Turkey. I visited many times the Treasury Department, the Prime Minister, the President, etc. And, and because it is very natural that even you are within this industry, and you are not very aware of the difference between startup and entrepreneur. You cannot expect they can know, they should know everything about entrepreneurship, isn't it? From their offices, it is your responsibility to create this awareness at the policymakers and tell your needs very clearly. And I am sure any policymaker in the world of any country will of course like to uh, push uh, the economic uh, developments uh, ahead. But the first uh, stimulus should come from you. This is my personal experience. Um, you talk about the importance of techno parks and universities, angel laws. Overall, Turkey is becoming a more intolerant country. The government has. Yes, stop, stop right now. That's not allowed. Don't, don't talk about that. No politics allowed. You ask a question, don't talk about politics. Yes, you I haven't heard me, sir. Yeah, no, you're making politics. a judgment. Yeah, don't, wait for, don't talk about politics. Yeah, let's no, hear the yeah, question. You. Yes, let's hear the question. Careful, yeah. That I will say, yeah. let's delete this question or not. Yeah. Just be really careful about that. Yeah. Um, but uh, generally, generally, of yeah. course, uh, entrepreneurs don't enjoy talking uh, about policy. I agree with you. Why? Because uh, we are totally concentrated on creating new job and making business. Because policy is something, I mean, changing your focus point, isn't it? But let me, I, I want to hear the question. What, what is your question about? So I agree with you that universities contain the seeds for the future entrepreneurs who are going to become important job creators. I'm curious about what you are doing in your personal capacity. You are a highly influential entrepreneur and businessman to help, you know, like recover some of the freedoms which are, you know, like getting lost because that is very important to the future economic development of Turkey. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I can answer this question. Yeah. It, it is not a <laughs> question that I... Uh, the, what you see on the screen, TV, and what is on in reality is quite different. This is this is uh, uh, very important. I have a lot of friends in Turkey. Yeah. So like this was based on their personal stories. I yeah. understand that media is highly manipulated and all. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, 
By the way, if you focus on your own business, for example, I'm focusing on my business, I'm very happy. If you don't focus on your own business and deal with uh, uh, different things, it is very possible very not to become <laughs> happy, not just in Turkey, everywhere in the world. <laughs> so uh, this is the case, I mean, because uh, let me tell you one thing. In 1992, uh, I was a university student. In 1995, we lived a big economic crisis in the world. In 19. Then 1997, another big crisis, just in Turkey, by the way. Then 2007, uh, the global economic crisis. Such things were happening. And of course, there were many political ups and downs within the country. So, in 1992, I had only $400. Many ups and downs, and today is 2016. I have more than four hundred dollars. I I am very happy. <laughs> so I think uh, we have to position ourselves. Entrepreneurs are very lucky people because we nobody can say anything to entrepreneur. Our purpose is to stand up on our own foot, not to become a loot over the shoulders of the public. I think that is very important. And create new jobs. That's what we are doing. If we are concentrating on this, you can do it everywhere in the world. Even in Greenland, you can uh, succeed uh, something. Uh, yes. Thank you. So uh, I have a question. Sure, sure. Yeah. So the question is, uh, uh, my question is more But if, if you are talking about freedom, uh, this is something different, of course. I mean, uh, that while you are focusing on your own business, the freedom of making something new is more important for the entrepreneur. Please. Yeah, so my question is uh, more related to like the startup world and where okay. things are happening now. We are in a uh, situation where companies are running and we are just uh, surviving in a way. So. The, uh, one, which, one thing which we are seeing lately is like very common. Uh, people saying, okay, you have a good idea, you are executing it, uh, but uh, you are focusing on customers and uh, you are getting money from the customers and uh, your business is doing good, you are growing in an organic way or linear way. Uh, but then there is a other guy, competition. He is only approaching, approaching investors and he is uh, collecting a lot of money so he can get all the money and grow very fast. And then that is the mindset which uh, like people generally are getting now, like this is a dilemma, I would, I would say, that uh, what should be the focus for an entrepreneur? Because your competition is getting rich, and if he has more resources, he can go much faster. But if you focus on the customer, then it will take some more time. The smart entrepreneur should be a re innovator. What do I mean by the re innovator? Uh, I developed this water. I'm the first one and I'm making good money. This means very short period of time, in a very short period of time, many entrepreneurs will start producing the same water, don't worry. And as the smart entrepreneur, I should know that if I am the innovator of today, it is very possible that I become a classic entrepreneur of tomorrow. In order to keep my innovative uh, positioning in the market, I should always be innovate. I should develop the one that I developed. And this is also uh, very uh, related with the understanding of the customer very closely. So I, I advise you to compete with yourself, not with the competitors. If you win this competition, you will always become the winner. Uh, in 1992, I was the first one who made the professional tour operating certificate program. One day, by the way, I was making good money, collecting $100,000 per every month. And I was very afraid while giving the commercials on the paper. Why? 
because I was making small. <laughs> I didn't want other entrepreneurs to understand that I'm making a good business. I didn't want, I was afraid. If a guy comes with his money and makes a big building, I, I, I didn't have the opportunity to catch that guy. I needed a little bit more time to uh, save money and compete with him. So I was very afraid. But uh, six months later, inspectors from the government came and asked me, where is your authorization from the government? Which authorization, I said. You are, by the way, in six months of time, I opened a branch office in Ankara and Izmir in three cities. In, at, the uh, at the end of the first year, I had 5,000 graduates. Flight attendants, tour operators, airport passenger services, stuff. He said, National Minister of Education, you should have a license from the National Minister of Education because you are issuing certificates to people. I'm saying flight attendant and I sign it and give it to. Uh, I really didn't know that I had to accomplish such kind of a procedure. I really didn't know it. But ministry didn't forgive me. Took me to the courts in Ankara, Izmir, Istanbul. I started to visit the courts. I am telling the judge, I am a poor university student. Here's my identity card. I really didn't have a bad intention. By the way, uh, now this is not the case, but in 1992, uh, it was uh, uh, from six months to two years jail was unauthorized. I was really upset. I was, I mean, I, I couldn't sleep. Uh, by the way, uh, of course, the uh, close environment, your friends, we didn't, didn't we say? <laughs> Excellent. So, however, but I catched, I catched an important uh, clue. The judge was giving the date for the next uh, episode to six months later. For these six months, I'm able to go to registering students. And six months later, you are putting a health paper another six months. So nobody is there. The court is going on, you are registering and making money. I said, but like a system this is. <laughs> if this is the justice system, I love the system very much. Because it is working very well uh, for my benefit. And in this time, one of the assistant of the judge said to me, why don't you go to the Minister of Education and apply and get the authorization and bring. if I bring it, does it work? Yes, of course. The court ends. Oh, that's a good idea, I said. And I went to the Minister of Education, applied. It was a very difficult 24 months because there was no curriculum like flight attendance course. Uh, I don't want to go into the details. I completed all these procedures in 24 months and I got the authorization. Then, while following these procedures, I was always saying that I hated the bureaucracy. I hated. After completed the procedures, I started to say, I love this bureaucracy. Why? Because I discovered that I will never have a competitor in the market because nobody will be able to compete and spend 24 months. <laughs> and, and for many years, for 20 years, no competitor came. Because if they advertise, I was complaining them immediately the next morning because I know what is going to happen. I completed that, that way. Um, I think. This is also something important. I mean, uh, you will make the re-innovation by also uh, catching up the, uh, your environment's pros and cons together. 
So I learned in my life, I never complain anything. Because if you complain something today, tomorrow you are, you are understanding that it, it was something good for you. This is my idea. So I never complain. If that is the case, then let's concentrate on the full side of the glass instead of focusing on the empty side. If you focus on the full side, then you become an entrepreneur. If you focus on empty side, then you become a bureaucrat and employee. Yes. So I have a question here uh, because I want to start something on my own, and let's say I have a lot of ideas bouncing off me. You know. So what I'm going to understand is, do I need to have a personal skill set, a personal expertise in that area? Let's say I'm not a chef and not a cook, but I want to open a restaurant or a food chain. Let's say I'm a finance guy. I don't have an IT background, but I have ideas bouncing. Or do I need to have that personal skill set for uh, you know personal uh, what you call understanding? Uh, skills before I pick up those ideas and go ahead and start off. I think it is at the level of you are at the level of entrepreneurship, isn't it? Yes. yes. So uh, I invite you to use your three organs very effectively. If you can use your three organs very effectively, the rest of the story is very simple. Your eyes are very important. Everybody looks at me now, isn't it? Some of you see me. Look at the door, see the door. These are different things. The ones who see the door create a business from this door. The ones who look at the door just look and pass. In 1990, uh, uh, before setting up my own business, I read an article. I think we are approaching to the end of the. I was in the library. I opened a magazine, Economy magazine. There was an article on franchising, like yours. I mean, like the idea in your mind. And in 1999, the first uh, McDonald's was opened in downtown of Istanbul. There is McDonald's here, isn't it? 1999. There was a queue. Everybody wants to eat cheeseburgers. And in a very short period of time, they opened 20 outlets immediately. The article was about franchising. I read it. I just wanted to understand what the meaning of franchising was. I didn't know it. But when I read it, I understood that McDonald's means franchising and I questioned by myself why and from 5,000 kilometers away a hamburger shop is able to come here and I'm able to eat it 30 minutes later but I'm still not able to eat Turkish kebab a good Turkish kebab within the city and I have to spend my two out of the city 